Welcome everyone to GDG Soweto. We've got another fire talk lined up for you guys. So today we have Abdul, who's going to tell us why digital ex So yeah, without further ado, I'm going to give it over to Abdul. He's going to introduce himself. And then from there, Abdul, you can just kick it off. The stage is yours. All right. Thank you. So I'm just going to share my screen. Oh, perfect. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, so have you ever wondered, um, when you go to watch a movie and then you realize, oh, the movie is in Chinese or the movie is in Arabic or a language you don't speak. And then you're unable to watch the movie even though it has been trending on Twitter or on social media. Or have you ever tried to buy a gift for your loved ones on an e-commerce platform, but you're unable to do so because the site does not work on your device. Today, we'll be taking a look at what digital accessibility is and why it matters. My name is Abdul Kudus. I am a front-end developer at Certifaction. Um, I also give talks like this relating to accessibility and try to advocate for as much digital accessibility as possible. I also am into community building, currently a co-organizer for a GDG chapter in Nigeria. And once in a while, I play games, mostly Call of Duty, and I'm also a football fan. Um, that's my Twitter handle, so you can connect with me, ask questions after this talk if you have any. So let's dive right into it. Digital products. Where exactly are digital products? These are basically anything you can deliver electronically that you can use on your devices, your handsets, your televisions, your laptops, anything electronic that you have and that you can use on them can be defined as digital products. It can be websites, can be mobile applications, can be games, can be movies, anything really, we can define them as digital products. Then moving on to what exactly is digital accessibility? You might have heard of things like A11Y, your accessibility on social media. Um, just to clear up the air, A11Y stands for accessibility, and it's because we have 11 characters between A and Y in accessibility. So that's why we call it A11Y. Um, it pretty much refers to making your digital product usable for everyone, regardless of what disability they have, what condition they are in at the moment, they should be able to use a digital product. Just to give a simple illustration here using a building, take for example, you have a building that's 40 stories tall, and then your office is at the top story, that's like the 40th floor. Um, for you to access the building, take for example, no stairs, no elevators, nothing, um, but you're able to access the building by climbing ropes, you're able to get to your office, climbing ropes every morning, that's fine, it works for you, right? But then you had an investor that wanted to invest in your company, and that investor isn't going to want to climb ropes to get to your office, right? So you called an architect and said, hey, um, our building doesn't have stairs, it doesn't have elevator, how do we get this person to my office easily? So it was like, um, maybe we can install stairs, right? So he did his magic, broke some things, fixed some things, and you were able to install staircases on the building. Um, the investor came and was able to get to your office after climbing 40 flights of stairs, but was finally able to get to your office, you guys discussed and you got the deal. That works fine your building is accessible to some extent, right? People are able to climb stairs to get to your office, that works. But then two weeks later, a 70 year old man decided, oh, I want to invest in your company as well. But then you wouldn't expect a 70 year old man to climb 40 flights of stairs. So what you did was you reached out to the architect and said, hey, we have this 70 year old man. He obviously can't climb 40 flights of stairs. So how do we do that? So he was like, oh, we can add an elevator to the building. So he went ahead and added an elevator. Now. Initially, the building was completely inaccessible. You were the only one that could access your office. You had to climb, use ropes to get to your office. But it worked for you, but it didn't work for other people. And then you went ahead and made it a little bit accessible by adding stairs to the building. That was accessible for people that could climb stairs, but not accessible for people that could not use stairs. And then you went a step further, and then you made it accessible for people that are not able to use stairs, but able to use the elevator. Now, one thing you can notice with all of these steps is that for each step, you're not just making it accessible for people that are disabled, but you're also creating convenience for other people. Take, for example, I could be tired, um, I could be hungry, I could not want to climb 40 flights of stairs. But because you have created an elevator for an old man that uses a wheelchair, I, I'm tired, I'm also able to use this elevator and makes my life easier. 
Now, moving on, why exactly does it matter? We've defined what accessibility is, we've defined digital products. Why exactly do we need to um, consider making our product digitally accessible? Now, I'm going to be dividing this into three major sections, looking at it from the individual perspective, looking at it from the business perspective, and looking at it from the legal perspective. Now, the most important one is the individual perspective. According to the World Health Organization, we have 1.3 billion people that's about 15% of the world population that currently identify as disabled. Um, that's a very big number, right? And it has a very huge implication on businesses, which we'll get to in a bit. These disabilities can be broken down into five categories or six. Um, and they're listed here. You have the visual impairment, you have the mobility impairment, hearing impairment, cognitive impairment, seizure and vestibular disorder. We're going to take a look at each one of these and how a poorly designed accessible product can affect this set of people. Starting with visual impairment. This is basically a term that experts use to define any type of vision loss. So whether you're completely blind, whether it's a partial loss of vision, color blindness, it could be whatever, but anything that doesn't allow you to see properly can be defined as visual impairment. And according to the National Library of Medicine, you have around 253 million people that have some sort of visual impairment. 36 million of them are blind, 217 have moderate to severe visual impairment. And not just that, it was also said that one in 12 men identify as colorblind. So if anybody tells you men don't know colors, well, it's not our fault, we are colorblind. Um, now moving on, there are several ways a poorly accessible site can affect people with visual impairment. The first one is products that don't use a screen reader. So if you have a mobile application or a website, it could be anything, an ebook that doesn't support use of a screen reader, that can severely affect people with visual impairments because they rely on tools like screen readers to help them to read the text on the screen. Um, you can just do a little bit of practice here. Pick up your mobile phone, close your eyes and try to type in a message and send it to someone and see what you're able to type. The thing is you realize how inconvenient it is for you to type something with your eyes closed. But in reality, we have about 253 million people that have to live their lives that way. Second thing is using colors alone to differentiate a chart. Um, you might have worked on analytics platform that relies on using bar charts, pie charts, whatever it is, and you have to find a way to differentiate them somehow. The most common way to differentiate them is to use colors. So you have the green for the good, the red for the bad. You could have a yellow for weight, any colors you want to use. But then there are people that are colorblind and not able to see these colors properly. You have people that have something called red, green color blindness. Now imagine you have a chart that was separated with red and green. People like that won't be able to see the difference because it was only separated using colors. One way to fix that is to use, um, some people would recommend using patterns. So maybe the green, charts will have a stripe pattern and then the other one won't have any pattern. So that way, if I'm not able to see the color, I'm also able to see the patterns and know that okay, these charts are different. Um, another one is not being able to zoom in on the text. This can be especially painful for people that are not able to see small text on your screen. And then when they try to zoom in your whole website or, or your mobile application. Website is able to um, accept people to be able to zoom in on the text and able to read the text clearly. Another one is using images that don't convey meaning without having a proper, and that convey meaning without having a proper description. Um, we've seen it very common in websites where you use images to make things fancy, sometimes use images to, to convey meaning to the user. Now that works fine for people that can see these images and can understand what these images mean. But for people that have visual impairments and are not able to see these images on your screen, it's a big problem. So you want to make sure you have, or you give them a proper description of what these images mean. You tend to see people do things like um, people sitting on a table or describe images as um, image of a girl, image of a flower, but you want to be more descriptive. Imagine you are seeing people talking about an image, but you can't picture this image. And the only thing that they tell you is a picture of a girl. That's not exactly descriptive. Um, and as a developer or someone that creates digital products, you want to make sure you give proper description. A good description might be something like um, a girl in the fields wearing a green dress, having sunglasses, laughing, but that's something like that that's properly and well descriptive. Um, another one, and that last one for this one, though there are many more, is poor color contrast. 
Now, quite often when choosing colors for your products, you want to make sure these colors have a very good contrast with the background they are being used on. I have a text beside this that has a very poor contrast with the background that says, this text here has a very poor color contrast. Now, this is an example of text that has a very poor contrast with the background. You, as someone that doesn't have visual impairment, might be able to stress your eyes a bit to see what's written there, but there are people that won't even be able to see this. So you want to make sure you consider users that have visual impairment and make sure the text have a good color contrast. Now, moving on, we have the second one, which is mobility impairments. Now, this um, identifies, this refers to users that identify with some sort of mobility issue, are not able to move with their legs, move with their hands, for some for different reasons it could be seizures paralysis maybe had an accident and were amputated there could be several reasons that could cause mobility impairment now people like this usually rely on assistive technologies some things like eye tracking or speech inputs google assistant cv several other ones like that so most times you're not able to use your hands you're not able to use your mouse you're not able to use your keyboard so they have to rely on voice commands so you say hey google tell me what the time is or hey google can you call this person that's an example now, for you to account for this type of people, your product should not only be accessible with a mouse. Now, it's very common for developers when we are building our products, we just test things with our mouse, make sure it works, and when it works, we leave it that way. We don't exactly consider people that can't use the mouse or people that are only able to use the keyboard. So when you're building your products, you need to make sure you consider this set of people. The next one is hearing impairment. Now, this is also very important because we have about 1.5 billion people having some sort of hearing impairments. That's a very big number, right? This kind of people now have to rely on things like sign language, closed caption, um, translations, transcripts, and all of that. So imagine you have a YouTube video, but you are not able to hear what the person is saying because you can't hear, right? And then there is no caption, there is no translation, nothing to help you understand what is being said. A very good example I like to point out and a very good example of a company that prioritizes digital accessibility is Google. Um, in the just concluded Google I.O., there was a talk about how material design does their research to make sure they um, are intentional about accessible products. One thing they did was in the video, they had two versions of their videos. One was for people that able to hear and see the video and another one was for people that were able to hear so they had a video where it was all sign language throughout now that's being intentional about your users they're able to provide a video with captions for users they're able to hear and then one with sign language for users that are not able to hear now just take a step back and imagine trying to watch your favorite movie it could be the latest spider-man movie the latest john wick movie in chinese or without sound and then there's no subtitle to help you understand what is being said. You're just seeing people moving. Uh, that's the reality of a, lot, of a lot of people in the world, 1.5 billion people to be precise. So you want to make sure whatever product you're building is accessible to this set of people. Moving on, we have cognitive impairments. Now this refers to itself people that are not able to concentrate on things. They are not able to learn things. They have trouble making decisions in their everyday lives. It could be caused by autism, ADHD, dyslexia, ETC. There are several other reasons that could cause cognitive impairments. Now, major pain points for this set of people include too much text, junky text, text that are not being properly justified. So you just have a website where things are just being messed up. They're not able to concentrate on one thing at a time. So one thing you want to make sure for these people is make sure you don't have too many things on your website. Try to um, separate them into several sections. Try to arrange them as much as you can. Make sure the text, the text are properly justified as well. Um, and then another one is the seizure and vestibular disorder. Now, these are people that probably experience seizures or are not able to um, take a look at flashy things and all of that. As developers, we like to have fancy animations, we like to have fancy things on our website, but we have to consider there are a set of people that are not able to see, unable to interact with these animations because it could cause things like epilepsy, dizziness, or vertigo in them. And could potentially lead them to the hospital. Um, so one thing you want to make sure for this set of people is you want to make sure you reduce as much animations on your site as possible. Most times there is these settings on your Android or a Windows device where you can turn off 
animations completely. But the problem is in your digital product, even if the user has tons of animation on their laptop or on their phone, for example, the digital product does not take that setting into account and then you show the animation to everyone, whether they turn up the settings or not. Now, imagine I have a settings that say, oh, I don't want to see animation on my device, but then I try to take your site and you're showing me an animation. That doesn't work, right? And the bad thing is this animation could trigger a seizure in me and then send me to the hospital. So you want to make sure you account for your users and try to reduce animation as much as possible. Another painful thing could be videos that autoplay. Now, this is also painful for me that doesn't even have some of this um, impairment or disorder. You want to try to make sure you don't autoplay videos. I've seen a lot of sites where you go to them and you just start hearing a sound from nowhere, not knowing where the sound is coming from, not knowing there is a video in the background that autoplays. So you want to make sure you allow the user to intentionally play that video to know that, okay, I am clicking on the play button before you play the video. That way I know I'm in control. I know I clicked on the play button before you start playing the video. Now we've mentioned five um, categories. There's also one category called speech impairments, not in this slide though. Now that refers to a group of people that are not able to properly form speech. Now, one way this could affect this kind of people is when they are using things like a speech impute. So your Hey Google, these people are not able to form speech properly. So when they try to um, enter a voice command, they probably are not able to see what they meant. And then the voice command doesn't work properly. So you want to create alternatives for those kind of people. Say, if voice command doesn't work, they should be able to um, type in whatever they want to say. Put yourself in their shoes. Imagine you want to buy bread, for example, and then you're not able to say bread properly. And then you say something else and then you end up buying the wrong thing. What you want to do is you want to give them the option of typing what it is they want to buy. So if they are not able to properly say that word, they're able to type it in and they're able to use your product easily. Now we've mentioned five, six people, but there are also other beneficiaries of having a properly accessible digital product. One of them is people that are temporarily disabled. So it could be that you on you on a normal day are not disabled, but maybe you went to play football like I usually do, and then maybe you broke your wrist. And at that point, the doctor advised you to stay in bed, not to use your mouse, not to use your laptops. So, but you can't just sit in bed, right? Maybe you wanted to do something, you wanted to buy a product online, you wanted to buy drugs online. Um, you should also be able to interact with your product. Now, these are people, this is someone that wasn't disabled on a normal day, but due to some certain circumstances, they were able to use your product. Um, another group of people are people that are situationally disabled. So not like you're disabled, but at that point in time, you are not able to use a product as you normally would. I give an example here of being at a very noisy party. So you went to hang out with your friends, you're playing music in the background, and you wanted to watch a very important video, but then that video doesn't have caption. You are not with your headphones, you're not with your earpiece, so you can't even plug anything in to listen to the video properly. But then you're unable to watch that video because it doesn't have caption. Now, these are another group of people that can hugely benefit from a digitally accessible product. Another one is people that might be disabled. So it could be that you need glasses or contacts to see properly. But that also means if I'm not with my glasses, I won't be able to see properly. So Having a digitally accessible product means this set of people are able to use your products properly. Another group are non-native speakers. So uh, imagine you travel to, I don't know, India, China, and you don't speak Hindu, you don't speak Chinese, and you're trying to watch a movie in the cinema, you can't understand what they're saying, right? So having subtitles that you added for people that had hearing disability, this would work well for non-native speakers because I don't speak Hindu, I don't speak Chinese, but I have translation, I have captions, I'm able to read and understand what is being said in the movie. Another one is um, older people with age diminishing senses. So as people grow older, they begin to they begin to lose their sharper senses that they had when they were young. So having some of these um, accessible features in your website would make sure these older people are able to use your site as they would when they were younger. Now, we've talked about the individual perspective of an the the ways it can affect your business from the individual perspective now let's look at the business perspective people with disability make up for almost one over four of the world's population now if you're planning to build a product that is going to be used across the globe you want to make sure everyone 
regardless of what disability they have at that point they're able to use your site more people means more money from a business perspective and imagine one of our four of the world's population not being able to use your site or your products that just means you're losing out on a lot of money and it's not just this one of our four of the world's population these people also have friends they also have families they have people that are looking for ways to support this disabled person you have um maybe even investors looking for how they invest in products that can help this disabled person so building for digital accessibility building products that are digitally accessible means you have potential investors potential um users that are willing to pay for your products to help and support this disabled person and not just that when you factor in the friends and the families of these disabled people when you factor in um all of those things you realize you are getting up to 53 percent of the world population having an inaccessible product indirectly means you have 53 percent of the world population not being able to use your website that just means you keep on losing money because you can't even account for half of the world population to be able to use your website properly and then the last one we're going to talk about today is the legal perspective now this is also very important because an inaccessible site just means you're going to lose money in countries like um, canada australia japan some countries in the european union they have strict digital accessibility laws so whatever product that you're building in these countries, you have to make sure they follow these laws. Not following this law could be a potential lawsuit. So someone could just decide, oh, your product is not accessible, so I'm going to sue you and you're going to have to pay me this amount of money just because um, you made your product inaccessible. And it can be very painful, right? Because these people are also human beings. They have the right to use um, your website. Now, there's a statistic that said over 74% of the lawsuits filed in 2021 were e-commerce sites. So there are a lot of e-commerce websites that are not accessible. And people decided, oh, I'm going to file a lawsuit against these people and they're going to have to pay me money. Now just imagine people trying to file lawsuits up and down because your website is not accessible and they try to get money from you. Now, in conclusion, right, accessibility is a very important part of any product. And the thing is, it's very difficult to incorporate it late in our product. Like I mentioned in the beginning where we have a building that was inaccessible at first. For you to install the stairs in a building that didn't have a staircase before, you're going to have to do a lot of breaking, you're going to have to do a lot of reconstruction to make sure you add the stairs into the building. But at that point, you're going to realize you wasted a lot of money, wasted a lot of time, wasted a lot of effort to get the stairs into the building when you could have planned it from the beginning. And it's just like any digital product. If you built the product and made it inaccessible at first, at that point, when you're trying to make it accessible, you're going to have to go through maybe a series of hiring to do one accessibility expert, then paying them salaries to make sure they make the product less accessible. And it's not just that, right? At that point, maybe your users have already filed a lawsuit, you've already lost the trust of your of your users because they try to use your product at that point and realize it's not accessible. So why should I come back to use your product when the first time I tried it, it was not accessible? You've already lost my trust, I'm not going to come back. Now, the earlier you consider accessibility in your research phase, in your design phase, in your development phase, the better for you. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I hope you've learned a lot and I hope you're able to incorporate accessibility in your daily life, in digital product as much as you can. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Abdul. Thanks a lot. Um, I just wanted to ask quickly one question there, which was to say, how do we then test our apps with these different types of situations that we come across when it comes to accessibility? Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. That's actually a very good question. Um, there are several ways. One of them is the automated way, which is the easy one. Um, for people like us that uh, maybe I don't have any form of disability, I'm able to see, I'm able to hear, I won't exactly be able to test as much as a disabled person would, but then I can try my best. The automated tools like Lighthouse, there is um, this extension called um, Wave that you can install on your browser that you can just use to do as much automated testing as you can. So it tells you things that you can improve on your website to uh, make your product accessible. But it's not just that. Another way, probably the most recommended way is to have some of these disabled people in your development process. So reach out to them 
conduct research, show them your product and help, have them test it to let you know if it works well for them. That's probably the best and the most advisable way for you to um, incorporate testing in your product. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that answer. Okay, um, a question on my side as well. Um, it's more of a scenario. Think of it this way. Think of it as a app or site built for, let's say, blind people. In this case, they would obviously have to rely on audio, right? So now let's say it's a news reading app that's audio. Now what I'm wondering is that how do we ensure that the information that they're getting through the audio does correspond with the news, you know? So like, what if the audio isn't saying what's actually in that news script? How, how is, like, how can we actually make sure that it, it it's not that way? I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So that that's where the manual testing come into play, right? So you have a news source that you want to convert into audio, Obviously, there are tools that can help maybe text to speech, speech to text that can help you convert the text into audio for blind users. But then you also want to make sure you take the extra step to go through this audio yourself or maybe hire someone that's going to go through this audio that's going to audit the audio and make sure everything that's been said is correct and corresponds with what was in the news outlet eventually um, in initially. So, just like taking the extra step, don't just rely on um, tools to do the conversion. Also have like human input because thing is tools are made by humans, right? They can um, have some level of errors in them, no matter how much they claim to be accurate, no matter how much AI has been um, added into these tools, they can make mistakes. So you want to make sure you have the human input as well. Go through this um, audio, make sure everything is correct and corresponds to um, the news outlet initially. It's also the same thing with videos. So when you want to present videos, people that can't hear these videos, you have things like closed caption. So on YouTube, you probably have seen this CC button that stands for closed caption. So when you click on it, YouTube tries to automatically generate um, caption for this, for this audio. But the thing is, even that caption isn't exactly accurate. So you might have, it works fine for maybe a US um, person or someone from the UK, but if someone from Africa, for example, is speaking, it struggles to generate the caption properly, right? So for things like that, you don't want to just rely on this closed caption or this automatic generative tool. You want to make sure human beings go through this, audit them, make sure that everything that's coming out from the closed caption or the audio is correct. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think you have another question. All right. Okay, Abdul, I just want to ask a follow-up question, which is to say, when it comes to forms, yeah, so let's see maybe challenges or accessibility opportunities when it comes to designing forms for users. Forms, yeah. Um, so they actually quite a lot. Um, one thing, and probably the most basic one, I would say, is try to turn off your mouse, try to disable your mouse, and see if you can use just your keyboard to access your form. Most times you realize that a lot of forms are not accessible because you can't use your keyboards. And one thing is when you're using tools like a screen reader, screen reader doesn't use a mouse, right? It tries to go through the form one after the other, right? Um, gets an input field, try to fill it, go to the next field, go to the next one, and then go to the button. So one thing you want to do as well is to add labels. So if you have a, um, a form for first name, you need to make sure the, the label is first name. So when the screen reader goes to that form, it tells the user that can't see the form that, oh, hey, this is the first name field. So type in your first name, then goes to the next field and say this is the last name field, type in your last name. But if you don't have some of these labels, the screen reader doesn't exactly know what to tell the user. It just says, okay, you have a field. What am I supposed to fill in that field, right? So you want to make sure you have these labels, make sure the the forms have like a proper focus um, uh, hierarchy. So you go from the first field down to the last field and then clicking on enter as well should be able to submit the button. I've seen a lot of forms where you um, try to, you, you finish filling all the forms and then you click on enter and it doesn't do anything, right? You want to make sure you're able to use your keyboard to access all of these forms. Select fields as well. 
lot of times people want to build custom select field components but then they lose a lot of the accessibility on that select field people are not able to use their keyboard to navigate you only have to use your mouse when in reality not everyone can use the mouse so i mean there, there are a lot of things you can do right like building accessible forms like a whole um different topic but these are just some steps that you can take to make sure like, users can use your forms um properly yeah. okay thank you i just have one last question there which is to say given that you're talking about the navigation of the forms i just want to know yeah. uh in terms of access accessibility for navigation of a site for example a complete site or a web page view mm -hmm. um so one thing you can do on, on your keyboard i think if you use tab the tab on your keyboard it like goes through each um action item so if you have a link when you click on tab it goes to that link click on another tab it goes to that link so it goes to different links when you click on tab and then clicking on space or enter can like perform the action on that site so there are a lot of times where you see um sites that are not exactly in the right order so when you click on tab it could probably go to like the footer and then sometimes go to the header so it's not exactly arranged so for a user that is relying on again screen readers the screen reader would actually have to go through each of these items one after the other and then if it's not correctly in order and it takes the user to the footer and then takes them back to the header that's going to be a little bit confusing right so you want to make sure items on your site have the correct hierarchy as well as the correct header so if you have a title use um, for example, for web developers, if you have the right type, if you have a type to use the H1 tag correctly, the H2 tags correctly, don't just have a random text that is bold in, in color. It might look bold to you as a user that can see the text, but a user that relies on screen readers won't exactly see this text as bold. They will just see like a regular text and will know that it is um, a header. So um, that's just another thing you want to take into consideration. Okay, thanks, Abdul. Um, yeah, okay, so I see the normal questions even in the chat. Okay, Abdul, uh, awesome talk. Thank you very much. I think accessibility is the one thing we sort of ignore as developers, you know, we're just ready to build and we don't consider yeah. the needs of all our users. So I think this has been a very important one. Yeah, thank you very much for listening and um, having me here as well. It was a pleasure. Okay, this, this has been GDG Soweto. Uh, thanks to those who've us. Uh, yeah. Okay.